those of you which have been uh, over the years here, uh, what we used to do with this uh, seminar that tries to give an overview of <laughs> things that have been going on in the Institute during the year. And, um, and after that, uh, we could celebrate that with, uh, with good food and uh, good drinks. We cannot do that, that this year, but this is the way it is. It's still good that we can meet and, uh, and enjoy the science uh, among us. Um, here I'm sharing the screen. Uh, this is the uh, talks that we will have today, very short talks, just to, to tell the others uh, what uh, has been going on. Now, the, uh, the old thing that, uh, that uh, uh, we used to do uh, every year was to take a picture of the, uh, of, uh, of the Institute of the, of the people. So what I'll, I'll uh, ask to do, all of you that have a camera, is to switch on your camera uh, now for a few minutes and we'll uh, try to, uh, we'll try to uh, take some pictures of, uh, of, uh, of the screen. So we will have something at least. So please, if you, okay, I'm just, uh, Edu is uh, helping me on that, but uh, we'll uh, <clears throat> continue with this. Just, uh, whoops. This is complicated, I can see, because we are too many people now. But um, again, <laughs> uh, just, I see good friends that uh, left. Uh, some time ago, but uh, that are uh, joining us for that. So, am I allowed to, to participate on the picture? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are allowed to participate also, also in the picture. So, uh, uh, let me see. I think this is the uh, we're trying to at least to uh, to have a record that we were. Uh, that we were here and uh, and meeting. Okay, I'll think uh, we'll now leave this thing and uh, go ahead with the uh, uh, with the science. And uh, we have uh, um, a rather busy uh, um, <coughs> schedule, but uh, <coughs> we'll uh, start uh, with a bit. I ask uh, every one of the speakers to. <coughs> Uh, to respect the uh, time allotted so that we can uh, finish in a reasonable time, but still having an overview of the uh, different topics of research that uh, have been going on during the year. Um, I think I already mentioned each of these uh, presentations correspond to a paper that has been published during the year. So, um, David, if you want to uh, uh, share your screen and go ahead. Okay, go ahead, uh, David, uh, whenever, you, uh, whenever you want. We cannot hear you. Okay. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I switch on my watch. Um, so the title of my, this uh, very super short talk is Andrei F. Coulomb Drag in Coulomb uh, Quantum Dots. And this work has been done in collaboration with uh, Mostava Tabatabey, Teran is actually the one who did uh, most of the calculations and the discussion, and also two professors from Madrid, Alfredo Levy and Rafael Sanchez. So, um, uh, how can I? Uh, just a moment. Okay. Let's go back, see if now, okay. So our work on, uh, on the Coulomb drag effect, okay? So for those of you who um, are not familiar with this effect, what we have is uh, here are two conductors, the active uh, system, which is driven by a voltage uh, source, okay? So you have a current flowing through this conductor from the left to the right, and then on top, we have a passive system, another conductor, 
um, which is in equilibrium. There is no voltage through, through this conductor. Now, if you if an, an electron uh, flow is uh, turned on here in the active layer, uh, the electrons in this uh, bottom system uh, are able to drag the electrons in the upper system by means of uh, Coulomb interaction, by means of electron electron scattering. Okay, uh, these two electrons here they transfer the momentum. Okay. And that's why you can actually drive a, a current through a, an, a, an equilibrium conductor. Okay, so that was kind of a hot topic in the in the nineties. Uh, around ten years ago, we revisited this uh, effect using now two quantum dots instead of two uh, extended conductors. In this case, of course, uh, momentum transfer plays no role, and it's actually the exchange of energy between the drive system and the drag system. Uh, the main mechanism that uh, drives this uh, Coulomb, uh, Coulomb drag effect. This has been observed experimentally. Okay, uh, here we have uh, the drive uh, system, the dot, the drag uh, system, uh, another quantum dot, and um, it is possible to observe a current or a voltage drop to to the to the drag uh, subsystem by flowing, uh, by um, inducing a current through the, through the upper system. I, I should emphasize that there is no particle exchange between the systems, okay? Everything is uh, driven by electron-electron interactions. In our work, what we have done is to, in the um, drug system, in the passive uh, um, conductor, which is here another quantum dot, we just replace one of the conduct on, on the terminals or the metallic uh, reservoirs with a superconductor. Now, when you do so, um, you still observe the conventional uh, drug, drug, uh, drug phenomenon. When you have uh, uh, electrons that can flow from the normal terminal to the superconductor by absorbing energy from the active uh, layer, but you have to do so, um, uh, let's say, uh, to overcome the superconducting gap. So you have to have like uh, high temperatures. What we have, the, the novelty in our work is that um, we were able to discover a new mechanism in which it is not necessary to go to high temperatures um, by, uh, let's say, um, um, Using the Andre Andre processes, okay. So these Andre processes, one electron and one retro reflected holes, they combine into a Cooper pair in the in the superconducting condensate, and then you are able to drag a current. Now, since a retro reflected hole is like a current flowing in this direction, there is a change of, a change of sign in the Andre current, and that's like the signature of uh, of this um, of this new mechanism. So this is a cartoon. Uh, which somehow summarizes the, the main physical idea. Uh, in the drive system, we have uh, green emanems, which uh, are flowing due to a voltage uh, drop, okay? So due to this uh, extra energy, they are able to tune the elevator in the drag system, which plays the role of this en energy exchange. And in the uh, drag systems, uh, we are, uh, electrons can go through the quantum dots only in pairs, only with this blue M and M is able to couple the orange one, then you are able to go into the superconductor and then you will be able to measure a new uh, drug, this new Andre uh, uh, Coulomb drug uh, phenomenon. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, uh, David. Uh, I think we will not take questions in this uh, seminar. I mean, people can discuss later, but it's just to give uh, uh, a very short presentation. So please, uh, Roberta, go ahead whenever you want.
Sorry, I couldn't find the button to unmute. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so I will try to be fast. Uh, so this work has been uh, realizing uh, has been a work realized by Rodrigo. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. And uh, so this paper has been uh, the, the first work uh, of Rodrigo and uh, he's been realizing collaboration with uh, Miguel, uh, Gianluca and Johannes. And uh, it has been published in this journal that I didn't know before, Cognitive Computation, uh, with a, in a, within a topical collection about uh, receiver computing. So this I don't want. Okay. So maybe I will just spend a few words speaking about the context of the work. And uh, the motivation of this work in general is uh, about uh, uh, learning which are the features that are needed uh, for a system to compute. And then generalizing to the quantum regime, try to see what is different if you try to perform computation into the quantum regime. Uh, of course, there has been a lot of work realized in digital quantum computation. And in particular here, I'm showing the picture of uh, the paper uh, of last year about quantum supremacy of uh, Google team in which they were showing uh, a possibility to explore the, exploit the exponential size of Hilbert space uh, in performing a very fast uh, computation, faster, supposedly faster than in a supercomputer. So beyond the details of the claim, uh, this is a, there, are, there have been very strong advances in the context of digital quantum computation, while uh, there are alternative uh, analog uh, um, way to consider computation that uh, for a physicist are actually particularly appealing. Uh, and I like this picture of Johannes about uh, which kind of system can be used actually to compute and in particular in the context of receiver computing. So receiver computing is uh, in this moment an opportunity because uh, at the Institute, we have expertise both in classical receiver computing and in complex quantum system. And uh, moreover, this is one of the line uh, that is in the Maria de Maestu. And uh, these are the first works we are um, obtaining in this field. So the paper in particular I'm speaking about now, uh, built on the works of Nakajima and Fuji that uh, published probably the first paper in uh, in the context of uh, quantum reserve computing, in which they do they use for this um, for reserve computing a quantum system. So the 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 aim of our work, even if it's a bit uh, technical, but just to define what is this work about, is to use the platform they proposed that is based on spins, and to exploit uh, to see uh, the quality of this platform using an indicator of the capacity of the performance of this system that was proposed in this work by Dambre and collaborator, that is this information processing capacity. So we use the system of spins that was proposed here, and then an indicator of the capacity of the system for doing, for uh, acting as a reserve in computing, and uh, we analyze this, um, this problem. So the, um, which is the idea? The idea of reserve computing in general is that you have an input and then you have a dynamical system that is processing this input. And without tuning the system, you just read out some information and you just uh, uh, optimize the information at the output in order to reproduce the, the, your target, your, uh, your task. And uh, in this system in particular, what is done is considering that the input can be encoded in a spin. The dynamical system is an easy model and the observables can be used as the output uh, layer that one optimized. So the dynamic of the world system is a map that uh, is a complete dispositive and preserve the trace. So you have a well-defined way to describe the quantum state evolution of your system. And then what we did was to analyze the performance of this quantum system as a quantum uh, reserve or computing, uh, considering these in different indicators and uh, we have, for instance, assessed uh, which is the importance of injecting information very fast to slower. And uh, in particular, the, this is the nice things uh, 
for physicists uh, of receiver computing with respect to digital computation, you really have a dynamical system. And then all the assessment is based on the feature of this dynamical system. So we assessed both uh, different parameters, the frequency in which you inject the information. We propose a way to extract more information by interrogating the system more often. And then what we find that is uh, if you introduce this time multiplexing that between inputs allows to you to ask information to the system more often, then you get more you extract more capacity, uh, you have that your system uh, show up more capacity, both in linear and <coughs> in his memory. And then we give some figure of merits in which we see that actually we can really explore the large Hilbert space size. So we just have five spins, but the system size is really four to the five. So you have a huge system and we can uh, assess um, we can see actually the performance of the system how it's growing. So I, I just wanted to give the flavor of the work uh, and uh, do not have uh, conclusions for this work because actually I would say that this work has been more uh, an origin of different things. And uh, in particular, uh, one of the major development has been actually the identification of the system as a system that is dynamically very rich in phenomena like many body localization and thermalization and there will be a talk about this topic uh, given by Rodrigo. Then another outcome has been the realization that we really need to take into account how to experimentally access this system in order to do receiver computing and this will be something that will be explored by Pera Mujal and that is started to be explored in a different platform also by Jorge Beni. And then we have uh, different lines we want to explore and everyone is welcome to join applying this reservoir computing also, not only as a quantum system, as a quantum reservoir, but also to quantum data and the possibility to, to use the EBNQ platform. So that's all. And I don't Thanks. know if you Thanks very much, uh, uh, Roberta. Uh, we continue uh, and uh, now it's the uh, time of uh, apostolos. Roberta, you have to. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Can you see that now? Yes. Perfect. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Maxi. Uh, the work I will uh, present today is has the title Accelerating Photonic Computing by Bandwidth Enhancement of the Time Layer Reservoir. It is uh, the result of a collaboration with Irene Estebanet, Yannick Schint, and Ringo Fischer. And uh, this has been published uh, this year in Nanophotonics. So first, I would like to give some uh, background information about this work. And part of our efforts in the last years uh, is dedicated to hardware implementations of time delay reservoir computing. Uh, in our case, hardware means uh, the use of photonic components that, uh, from which we can benefit in terms of computational speed. And the common uh, and uh, lately rather popular approach has been the use of semiconductor lasers as nonlinear nodes, where we use a reservoir topology to include them and define virtual nodes along a fiber loop in a ring configuration. And uh, in this way, we introduce uh, recurrent connectivity among the nodes and the temporal distance that we have uh, between the nodes, uh, theta defines the processing time speed of uh, the reservoir. And the inverse, of course, is the uh, processing speed rate of the reservoir. And in a computing task, uh, the information to be processed, uh, as I have here, M of T, is optically injected uh, into the reservoir by an external injection laser. And the diverse responses that we get from the reservoir actually are used to make the computation. Specifically, the optical injection uh, properties has been used in the past. And uh, related to that, strong optical injection in the past has been used uh, for uh, providing bandwidth enhancement in during directionally coupled lasers. And uh, mainly this was demonstrated for broadband chaotic operation of uh, these devices. Here, our aim was to speed up the photonic reservoir capabilities by using the concept of uh, strong optical injection. So in order to first measure the frequency response of our system, we encoded as input information broadband noise. And then we recorded the response of the reservoir in terms of its uh, spectral properties. And in this example, I have uh, two operating conditions of the 
critical parameter space of the reservoir, which is the feedback strength and the frequency difference between the two lasers. And uh, we compare the emission for two different strengths. The, with red, uh, we have a condition which is related to moderate strength in the chain. This is a typical value that we have been using so far in all these systems, equal to 0 0.4. And with the blue, we have a trace that has a five-fold five uh, amplification. So in the last case, with the blue curve, we consider that we have a strong optical ejection condition. And in total, uh, eventually, we have to quantify somehow what is the frequency response uh, of the system. For example, in our case, we uh, create a metric that contains uh, this frequency that includes 80%, for example, of the emitted uh, optical power. Eventually, for these two strengths, uh, optical injection strengths, moderate and strong, we create a high detailed mapping of the parabetic space, which is critical to define the operating uh, regimes of the reservoir. And uh, overall, we see, we verify numerically what we expected that with strong optical injection, we achieve a bandwidth enhancement in almost the entire uh, parameter space uh, that we investigate. So the thing is now uh, how this affects the reservoir performance in the computing task. Uh, the output that we obtain from uh, a reservoir is based on this time delay configuration on transient responses. This means that the processing speed time, this theta, must be smaller than the response of the system or equivalent. But it should not be much, much uh, smaller because in this case, the system will not be able to respond to the very fast input variations. And we explore these two conditions in a task that we introduced here. I will not give uh, so much of information, but the task was a signal recovery task of 180 kilometers of fiber transmission. The only thing that I will mention is in order to achieve an, a decoding that it is uh, error free, we need a logarithmic bit error rate of uh, this value or below. And when we introduce a slow transient operation, for example, a theta at 100 picoseconds, which is not actually so slow, but this is what we have been using already in many of our configurations, and we compare the performance of the computing pass with moderate and strong injection, we see that uh, more or less we get the same minimum error rate performance in both scenarios, but the only thing that we can get from the strong injection is a wider tolerance in terms of the parameter space uh, where we operate uh, the reservoir. But if we consider now a very fast transient operation with a theta of 12 picoseconds, the situation is completely different. Moderate injection conditions uh, cannot offer us the desired uh, signal recovery. And this is due to the fact that the transients that we are using of theta are too, too fast for the system in order to follow. On the contrary, when we introduce the strong injection, we see that we have a high tolerance regime in the parameter space that we investigate. And at the same time, we get the minimum error as we've had it before, so we can recover the performance. And finally, as an experimental validation of this work, we have uh, uh, tested the same recovery task in the uh, nonlinear photonics lab with a slightly smaller, uh, sl uh, lower transmission by 10 kilometers in order to compensate for noise uh, sources and instabilities, experimental instabilities. But we were able to test until now the slow transient operation, where indeed we validate the wider tolerance that we ob observe in a strong injection rather in the normal injection conditions. And uh, of course, we are still pending the operation in the very fast, uh, very fair, fast transient regimes of 12 picoseconds, something that we will be able to implement with the new equipment uh, that we have uh, received. And for that, we will use uh, this process of uh, bandwidth enhanced operation of the reservoir in order to see if we can get the minimum performance as we've had it in the other case, in the slow transition. So that's it for me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Apostolos. Uh, we continue now with uh, Emilio. I ask again the speakers to, to remain within the five minutes uh, uh, that we are uh, <coughs> scheduled. But, 
Emilio, are you around? Now, okay. Hello, everyone. Okay. Yes, we see your okay, here is my screen. I, I guess you see it. Yes. Okay. Um, this is a, a work uh, we did with people in Norway, Luis Angeluta and student Jonas Ronin and postdoc Auden Skaugen. Auden Skaugen is now in Tampere. And here at the FISC, uh, Cristobal and I worked on that. It's a work in which we, we try to, to make analogies between the forces acting on impurities in classical and in quantum fluids. So what is, what is this about? Um, at very low temperatures, uh, a good model to, to describe Bose condensates is the gross pitevsky equation. Uh, and it is, it, is a, it is known that if you make the modern transformation, uh, so you replace, you take, uh, you take the modulus of the wave function as a density and the gradient of the phase as a velocity, then this, this equation turns out to be exactly equal to the Euler equation of a classical fluid. Uh, so you, so this, those are the equations of the result. This is the continuity equation, and the, and the other is the equation for the velocity. That if you plug the, this effective potential, you get the Euler equation for a fluid of a pressure proportional to the density square, and and this is the novelty, an extra term which is called the quantum pressure. So this nonlinear Schrödinger equation or gross pitevsky is related to some to some uh, classical fluid, but with a correction, which, which is called the quantum pressure. This gave rise to a, to a whole world, which is quantum hydrodynamics or quantum turbulence, so try to relate uh, properties of fluid flow at the, in the very low temperature regime or in the, in the quantum regime. In order to understand this type of uh, behavior, this type of turbulence of hydrodynamics, one important tool is, the, is to, to, to put particles or bubbles of impurities to follow the motion of the, of the fluid or the, of the superfluid. So one has to now has to, to understand how particles move in a in a quantum fluid. For a classical fluid, this has this is a very long history, and in the 80s things were more or less sorted out by this paper by Maxi and Riley, that they identified the different forces that act on a, part, on a small particle in a fluid. So, I, uh, so this is the classical Stokes viscous force proportional to velocity to the difference between the velocity of the fluid and the velocity of the particle. And also, okay, some corrections with the Laplacian of the of the of the velocity of the fluid, something called the inertial force. So there are lots of lots of terms here. And in the, there are in previous works, the motion of particles in quantum fluids has been interpreted in terms of the two fluid model. So interpret the quantum fluid as a mixture of a normal fluid and a in a, in a non viscous fluid, and a zero viscosity fluid. Uh, uh, and with this, there are very, very interesting experiments and explanations of experiments in, 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 fluid, uh, in superfluid helium. But this type of description uh, misses completely the quantum pressure and other corrections, and then is not expected to be good for ultra cold gases and post condensates. So the idea here in this, this work was to try to, to compute the forces in several situations, try to, to, do, to, to, to quantify them in the same way or as, as close as possible as with the maxi really equation for the forces on a particle on a classical fluid. So we model the, the interaction between the impurity and the condensate by an interaction that is, a, say, a localized interaction around the particle. RP is the position of the particle immersed in the superfluid. And then we calculate the force by this, by, by this uh, consequence of Ferenfest theorem, in which you, you make the gradient of the, of the interaction potential average it with, the, with, the, with the probability of the, of the with the density of the quantum fluid. So we did this, this in, several, in several situations. In this, essentially, this, you are seeing in this movie, the, in the moving frame, so there is a particle. We move the particle uh, to the right, but, but the, we are seeing in the moving frames. Then you see that the fluid is perturbed by this. It's perturbed, and then we try to, to, to calculate per, the perturbation of the particle on the fluid perturbatively in the interaction in JP. JP. And from this, we, we try to, from the perturbed fluid, we try to calculate the, the force of, on the particle. In at supersonic speeds, you, you get other, a, different, a different pattern, but the, the calculation would be the same. So what we did, uh, so making 
short and long history, we calculate uh, to the first order in the interaction, we get something that is, was the equivalent of the inertial force. So it's in the classical fluids, there is a term that depends on the derivatives of the, the time derivative of the, of the fluid velocity. And here we have also the time derivative of the fluid velocity. And that is multiplied by the ratio between the, the coupling constant between the particle and the superfluid and the, and the superfluid particles themselves. So this is the modulation. And then we get facts and corrections as in the classical case with Laplacians of the velocity. But uh, in, in the classical case, the facts and corrections only dependent on the size of the particles. Here it depends on the size of the particles and in the quantum correlation length. So it's the, it's the, the quantum ingredient that appears here. So here are some, some uh, examples of um, uh, uh, comparison between the, between the, between the, the computed formula from the numeric, so the computed uh, force from the numerics and the, and the analytical formula in the when the particle is is is, uh, is is put in motion. And here there is the formulas when you in our situation here we we add uh, some uh, dissipation on the quantum fluid and then we compute the the force in a in a different situation just to show that uh, if there is zero dissipation there is no there is no viscosity there is no force until the, the velocity of the particle exists, the, it is larger than the sound of the speed of sound. And then when the sound, the velocity is larger than the sound speed, there is a, there is a large uh, emission of sound and large dissipation. We have formulas for them. And when you put dissipation in the, into the superfluid, then the, the transition is smoother. We can calculate the, the drag at low velocities, which is proportional to the velocity as in the classical stocks like situation. So this is more or less the, the idea we wanted to show you and thank you for your, for your attention. Thanks very much, uh, Emilio. Now we start uh, moving uh, away from traditional physics and we have uh, Claudio. For some reason it is Raul that we see, but it should be Claudio. Thank you. No, I'm not using Raul. I'm not using the Claudio's account this time. What is Claudio? I don't know. Well, if Claudio is not here, it's... yeah, he is. He's talking, but he. I have many trouble with sound myself. I have to restart my computer. But I don't know if. No, no. Can you hear me now? Can you hear yes. me? Now? Yeah. Now, okay, Claudio. Let's just remove because I updated my computer this morning and nothing is working. Sorry. Okay. So let me know if you see my my presentation at least. Do you see it? No. No. Sound is not very sound is not very good. We don't see your presentation. Should we go ahead? Uh, should we go ahead and you try yeah, to please. At the end? Okay. So then it it will be the, the, the time of Massey and Claudio will come to the end. Hi Massey. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, just give me one second. Ah technology. Good. Okay. Now okay. you should my screen. Yes. Perfect. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to present this uh, this word on mitochondrial interaction networks that we published this year. And uh, as you can see here, well, we published it in uh, Nature Systems Biology and Application. And this has been a collaboration with a lot of people from Luxembourg, Denmark, and Germany, plus myself uh, in Spain. And you will see why we have so many people, I think in the next few minutes, it will be quite clear. So uh, first of all, what are uh, mitochondria? I guess that you all know more or less that mitochondria are like the power plants in cells. So they produce the energy that then the cell is uh, going to use. Uh, what is not very well understood is why mitochondrial function is present in a lot of different diseases, starting from neurodegenerative diseases, <laughs> like Alzheimer or Parkinson, that will be the topic of this, uh, of this talk, of this work. But also they have, seen, they have been seen in diabetes or cancer. Uh, as far as I know, we don't really understand why mitochondria are so important in all these diseases, but it's there. And what was most surprising, at least for me, was that mitochondria form actually networks. That is, they like to be in touch and to contact or to be in contact with each other. 
And it seems like here you have an image of different mitochondria together. And it seems that this is associated to an improved energy production. That is, there is a better like efficiency in the system, but also there is a regulation of signaling pathways and things like that. So uh, this whole project started uh, a few years ago, uh, specifically, oh, one second, okay, specifically four years ago, when uh, this group of people from Luxembourg uh, published a framework. Essentially, they are able to make a set of uh, high, super high definition photos or images of a cell, and they are able uh, through a well through a quite complex process and program to extract the position of in 3D, in three dimension, of each one of the mitochondria that you have in the cell. And therefore they are able to create what they call complex mitochondrial networks. That is, they are able to understand how they interact between them. Uh, at this point was when I met the, the, the leader of this group, Frank, and I told him, well, you have mitochondrial network. You know, I work in, in networks actually. So why don't we try to join our forces and see what comes out of this? Uh, this was a huge project, a huge paper, three years of work, a lot of subjects, almost one terabyte of data, because as you can imagine, we had to imagine a lot of cells and process a lot of data, but the results are quite clear, uh, quite neat, I think. So first of all, we tried to understand this using standard network metrics. Uh, we were expecting uh, to see the typical scale-free distribution in the... Um, in the links uh, in the nodes degree. Of course, this was not the case because at the end, these interactions are spatial constrained. Uh, that is one mitochondrium cannot be in contact with thousands of mitochondria. There is just not space. There is not just enough of physical space. But what we have seen is that mitochondria actually form clusters or connected components, if you want, within these networks. And what is more important is that we compare control subjects so the, the structure created by mitochondria and control subjects and uh, from patients of uh, Parkinson's disease. And we saw that there was a clear difference. That is, in the Parkinson's disease, mitochondria try to create larger structures. And we hypothesize that this is kind of a compensation mechanism. That is, each mitochondria is not able to produce enough energy, and therefore they have to like collaborate between them to, to find a to improve their, uh, their efficiency. We also analyze a classical network metrics like efficiency, diameter, and so forth. And we saw that there is a clear correlation between the topology of these networks that are created by Metacore and the clinical scores. So essentially you can relate this very micro scale structure of interaction with the overall uh, cognitive decline, if you want, of, of the patient, which was quite impressive. And also we were able, here in the bottom, to use these topological metrics to classify or to create a new form of diagnosis for, uh, for Parkinson. We went even ahead and uh, what I've shown up to now is just for idiopathic uh, patients. That is, patients that have Parkinson's disease, and we don't know exactly why. There is no known cause or mechanism involved. But there are uh, quite an important group of patients that are genetic to this. That is, there are several mutations in some genes that are known to be associated with a higher probability of, uh, of developing uh, Parkinson's. And uh, in this case, what they did was to take neurons from people, from genetic PD patients, in which there was a mutation in the gene that is essentially the most important one in this case. And then what they did also was to take these neurons, apply a CRISPR-Cas9 editing technique to correct this mutation. And therefore, in theory, go back to a neuron that was healthy. But what we saw is that this is actually not the case. So in any case, in all cases, networks are larger in PD patients and even correcting the genetic error or mutation does not improve, let's say, the, the dynamics of, uh, of, uh, of mitochondria. But even beyond that, and this is getting really crazy, what they did was to take cells from control subjects, from different types of patients, start making mutation on genes. And so we have a lot of results. 
we have analyzed a lot of topological metrics and we see some common pattern that we believe are a kind of compensa compensation mechanism. Essentially, um, mitochondria try to create larger and more tree-like structures in order to compensate for a reduced production in energy in each one of them. So uh, just to conclude, uh, I think that if I may say so, I mean, I really like this paper, not just because we have some great results, like that we can relate this very micro structure of connection with even uh, cognitive uh, performance of people. Uh, this could be a new venue for biomedical research, especially for detecting new keys to be treated this disease. But also it's a great, it was a great collaboration because we had people from biology, medicine, surgeons and so forth. So very nice, a very nice experience. Uh, thank you. And of course you can check the paper if you want more details. That's all from my side. Huh? Yeah, we lost the chairman, I think. I, I am hearing him to talk by by the phone. So perhaps the next oh, okay. the next one can just start start uh, uh, sharing a screen and, be, and begin. Uh, because I think is, is is that me? I think it's me, but I'm not sure. Uh, yes, it's you. Yeah. Uh, so go ahead. <laughs> can you see this? Yes. Can you see this? Yes. Right. Okay. Um, so I'm presenting this work um, with with uh, Joe. Why is this uh, advancing automatically? Um, with Joe. So this is uh, on the other side of the number of authors, so only two. Um, but before I do this, so from the program today, right, so one sees these words, couple quantum dots, spin-based quantum reservoir computing, rat hippocampus, mitochondria, as we've just heard, electric power systems will follow, urban transportation systems, and Ebola outbreaks in Sierra Leone. So I think this, together with the master's defenses this week, are a perfect dis um, a demonstration of Stauffer's theorem. <laughs> so do you, so you all know Stauffer's theorem, do you? Or do you know? Oh. So oh, you should read Stauffer's work, right? So Dietrich Stauffer um, unfortunately died last year, but you can find his theorem here, right? Um, the basic theorem of interdisciplinary research states, physicists do not only know everything, they know everything better, right? So this is what we're demonstrating here. And in fact, this is not yet complete. The theorem continues. This theorem is wrong. It is valid only for computational statistical physicists like us, right? So this is what Stauffer says. And I think we're, we're demonstrating that this is true uh, in, in, in the seminar and throughout this year. Um, okay, so and I'm adding uh, complex ecosystems to this. So I'm presenting this work with, with Joe. Um, that appeared in, in Nature Communications a few weeks ago. Um, and this is about, well, complex issue ecosystems and dispersal induced instability. So what, um, what does that mean? Um, so one has to go back um, 40, 45 years to, to Robert May, who also died uh, recently. So I'm, I'm talking about lots of dead people. Um, and he asked, will a large complex e system be stable? And he came up with a criterion um, that I'm sort of plotting here or showing here. And of, of course, I have no time to talk about this in detail, but there's a quantity that he called complexity of the ecosystem that has to do with um, the variation of the interaction coefficients and how many species there are and how connected they are. And he had a, a, a bound for this. That must be uh, less than one for things to be stable. Um, so the conclusion was that complexity tends to make ecosystems unstable. So this was it from the 70s. And that um, met resistance from um, various uh, communities and, and from ecology, because there are indeed complex ecosystems that are stable. And then a, a lot of work has been done since, and, and uh, May has been sort of um, attacked, I, I guess one could say, and say, well, this model is very unrealistic. And if one adds more realism and more components and more details, then this, this bound on complexity will surely go away uh, and so on. So that is the, the one line of argument one can, well, that has been taken. Um, you can also read about Robert May. Um, there was a, 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 an article in El País early on that um, Claudio and I wrote, I guess. Um, so you can find that if you if you like to know more about him. Um, so and in this work, 
Um, Joe and I combined uh, trophic structure and the dispersal into May's original model. So, um, so there's a, a kind of predator level and a prey level, and each of them contains many, many species, and they can also disperse in space. And these analyses are um, based on um, eigenvalue spectra of large um, random matrices, and you can see uh, examples here. And this is a typical example of a, of a Turing instability. So you can see tunnel A, B, C, um, increasing wave number Q, and you can see that in the first panel, the, the, this is stable, all eigenvalues are on the left hand, on the left half plane, then it crosses into the positive um, half, and then it goes back for larger wave numbers. You can see that plotted in panel D, the largest eigenvalue of a function of, uh, as a function of a wave number. And that's what you all know is a Turing instability. And um, then the lines on here um, are uh, the, the product of Joe's very, very hard work. Um, um, computing the spectra of these matrices uh, analytically. So I recommend you work through the 71 page supplement in detail, if you uh, ha have nothing to do over Christmas. Um, so, but that it, um, it had previously sort of not been observed in this way. In fact, there was a, a paper not that long ago that claimed the opposite, that actually adding dispersal to these systems stabilizes. So that was a contribution to this, what I said earlier, right? If one adds more stuff, then um, this instability is predicted by May would go away. And here we, we sort of clarified that and, and, and our paper is not actually in contradiction to the earlier one. In fact, we, we build up a, a more coherent picture of the two. Um, so that is the contribution here. And um, this is also shown in these kind of diagrams. So on the left, you see kind of a plot of stability in, in a space spanned by two parameters, predation and complexity and blue means um, stable and red is unstable. So that's in the absence of dispersal. And when you add dispersal, there's a region that is now yellow that used to be stable and now becomes uh, unstable. Um, and you can also plot it in this way. For those of you who, who are familiar with Turing instabilities, and that I guess is most of you, you normally need a, a sort of certain threshold ratio of diffusion constants to observe this instability. And this plot shows that if you add complexity to the ecosystem, that threshold is actually lowered. So that is that, that decreasing line that you see here. Um, and overall, I think um, one observation uh, that we like to convey in this paper is that adding more details to the model by May um, gives actually rise to more ways in which an equilibrium can become unstable. And, and we therefore think it is unlikely that making this mo model more detailed or more realistic will fully remove um, the bound on complexity and, required for stability. That's what I have to say. Thanks, Tobias. Thanks very much. We can now move on to uh, Pera, if this works. Uh, yes. Is it? Uh, OK. So good. Uh, should I, do you see my, my screen? Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to talk uh, today is a work that has been done together with Benjamin Carreras, uh, Ede Batista Tachol Suizé, who was a PhD student here some time ago, and uh, Jose Maria Reynos Barredo at, um, at uh, Instituto Carlos III, at the University Carlos III in Madrid, and Damia Gomo. And uh, it was published in, in, in the journal Chaos uh, recently, and it was uh, one of the editor's pick and fetch feature in, uh, in the cover of the, of the web page of Chaos at, at, at the time of publishing. So uh, basically the, the idea behind the model is that, well, power networks are composed of many, many things, power plants of different kinds, uh, uh, power lines of transmission, power lines of distribution at the very different voltages, a lot of substations to interconnect that, consumers and all that. And some of these things are susceptible to fail, okay? Effective components, human errors, whatever severe weather. And then at some time, there might be a blackout. I mean, a big failure that leaves without electricity, a big part of a, of a country that, for instance, this example in 1965 in Northeast US and Ontario, which uh, left 30 million people without electricity. There are many other examples. This makes big news on the newspapers. And of course, there is people that are even trapped on the underground, have a lot of problems, just, just the, walk, the, the lack of electricity. There's a lot of other subsequent problems. Of course, this can happen at some time. 
and it can happen again. In the same region, by the way, in 2003, there was another blackout, that, but this time is different. It was bigger. Now it's 55 million people. And uh, Time Magazine covered this blackout and subtitle. Can it happen again? Well, if the question is, can it happen again? The answer must be yes. Whether it may or not is another question, but it can, for sure it can. It has not happened on that region yet. Again, since then, but it has happened in many other places and these things tend to repeat. So, a, more, a way to, to model that or to, to, to understand this is, uh, is the, what is known as the OPA model. OPA stands for Oak Ridge, uh, CERC, and Alaska, which are the, initial, or the, the three institutions to which the, or the authors of the original article belong to. And basically, this model tries to convey the evolution of the power grid over a long period of time, over decades. It, it considers that there are blackouts at some point. There is a faster scale in which there is a blackout. And then utility companies upgrade the system after the blackout. So they will improve the lines, they will improve the power stations, they will increase the capacity. Then a blackout might happen again, and there'll be a subsequent increase of the capacity of the lines, and this goes on and on for a long period of time. Okay, so uh, basically, after all this long time evolution, the, the, the grid, the power grid organizes in a sort of self, uh, self uh, on a critical state, which is self-organized, so self-organized. In a, in a critical state. And uh, so it is a sort of SOC, uh, self-organized criticality model. And, uh, and, and basically, the, the idea here is not the fact to model the detailed dynamics at, say, second time scale evolution of the frequency fluctuations and all that that we have also done in other works, is to see how will the network behave when you keep increasing the stress of the system by some increasing the load over a long range, a secular growth of the load, and then the response of the utility companies to that growth. Okay, so that, that's a model for workouts. And what we address in this particular model was the following. Again, power grids has many ingredients, but there is one ingredient which they are lacking, and it's batteries. There is no storage. Okay, there is or very few storage, practically no storage in, in power grids. Therefore, uh, demand must balance generation or generation must balance demand, whatever you want to say. Okay, and this usually is done in the way that, in the second way. So generation balance demand, whatever the consumer asks, power plants provide. Of course, Generation is going towards a more amount of renewable generations, which is not as controlled as classical generation, and furthermore introduces fluctuations, and demand is also subject to fluctuations. So there is a complaint, uh, say, an alternative approach to that, which is used demand side management. There are several techniques to do that, but basically the idea is that those techniques, in those techniques, you adjust the demand rather than always adjusting the generation. The control somehow is transferred, is shared between generation and demand. What we have done is to introduce fast, fast power fluctuations and demand control in a model, in the model for blackouts, and see what is the effect of the fast fluctuations and the demand control on the stability in front of blackouts. That's what we have done basically. So we have provided three extensions to the OPA model, the OPA model. One is including intraday variation. The OPA model was a time scale of a day. So there was basically consumption for a day was no. The fact that there is a peak uh, in the morning and a larger peak in the evening in consumption and a bow in the night. So this is introduced. We also introduced random bursts occurring at different places in the network and at random times or of random amplitude. And also introduced demand control. Nodes are capable of postponing some tasks if there is a burst at a given time and the consumption is above a given limit, this recovery rate. And what we have shown is that if you introduce burst, then you get additional blackouts. This is the frequency of blackouts, that, the red line that increases linearly with the burst amplitude. When you introduce control, there is a range of burst amplitudes for which control is very effective, suppressing basically the blackouts. So the frequency of blackouts is the same as the reference frequency without 
without uh, power bars nor with control. So demand control could be, could be efficient to, to say, to avoid these frequency blackouts. What is also interesting is that there are different ways to, prov to provide additional control in the system. But many of these ways prevent small blackouts and increase the size of large blackouts. So the blackout distribution gets power, uh, we get tails which are longer and longer. In this precise way to introduce the control, we reduce the blackout, uh, the number of blackouts, the free, sorry, the frequency of blackouts, mainly of the small blackouts. We increase as why we the frequency of the middle-sized blackouts, but we do not increase the size of the large blackouts. So the tails remain the same, which is an advantage of all over other other control techniques proposed before that were not capable to bring in task from the, uh, say, from one time of the day to another time of the day, because basically this control is capable of bringing task from the peak hours to valley hours. And just briefly, we also check the, 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 the how the blackout has transferred from one time to the other. In the region where blackout works very well, <coughs> basically, uh, or blackouts uh, basically are suppressed and there is practically no transfer to other times of the day. In the region where blackouts is very is large amplitude and we cannot fully control the blackouts, what the control does is transfer part of the blackouts to the night uh, and still it decreases the number of that, but it's not capable of controlling all of it. And also one can check that without control, blackouts has a by model distribution regarding the number of lines affected uh, a large number of workouts affecting only a few lines, another peak affecting about eight lines. And uh, this my model distribution with control changes and basically the peak of workouts occurring for a small number of lines is completely suppressed. And this is what one expects of a control which is local to, uh, to act over workouts that affect many lines we, seem, we need something which acts at a more global scale. And that's basically all uh, that I wanted to, to tell you. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Pera, for your presentation. Next one is uh, Jose, if he's around. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I'm okay. Let me stop sharing. Uh, stop. Okay. Uh, okay, stop, me, I guess. Let me start. And uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, okay. So then this is the, the presentation. <laughs> okay, so this, this, um, this work was a, a paper that um, has been published in scientific reports. Uh, and it's a collaboration with people from from different institutions, uh, like uh, well, Alais now is in, in Queen Mary University, Ricardo in in the Fundación Eduardo Kessler in, in Trento, and Fabio that is Fabian Maxim uh, that <laughs> that is also around. Um, so okay, the, the the topic is about um, what happens when we have huge events, no, like uh, no concerts, demonstrations, no. So uh, up there you have London, and down is Barcelona. And uh, well, I mean, these people have to reach to that point and they also have to go back home no, when they finish the, the activity. And that means that they have to use uh, public transportation for that in most of the cases. And we want to study how these uh, public transportation networks can or not uh, bear the, the huge overload that something like this uh, means for, for it. No? Um, well, I mean, how we do it? Well, we do it with um, multi-layer networks, with vehicles, with unlimited capacity and doing uh, agent-based uh, model, okay? Um, yeah. It's essentially... Uh, so it, yeah, uh, my, what I looked at was just... Sir, sorry, can you switch up, switch up the, the so video? I just used five. <laughs> five. Use five. Yeah. Okay, so then the, the question is that what we want to measure is um, the time it takes for them to, to reach home uh, with the, um, let's say, with the situation where there is a, a big event minus the, the time that they will take for them to do it without that event. You know? So for that, we have a kind of optimal value, which is essentially something that you can calculate uh, in the transportation network with the, with the optimal, let's say, traveling time. And uh, this, this delay will be essentially our main uh, metric, okay? And then what we, we are going to find, uh, and this is kind of an advance, is that actually there is a, a, a scaling uh, of uh, this uh, this delay with uh, the number of people that you put into event that is this i okay and uh, later we will see what this uh, exponent is um well i mean as physicists uh, <laughs> i don't know if we know everything better <laughs> but no, we know how to do a, a cow completely spherical okay and this is what we start with so imagine that the, our transportation network is aligned and um, 
there is two directions. So essentially, you have one on one direction, the other direction, and then we have the walking the walking um, uh, network that is bidirectional. Okay, so they can always walk uh, these agents, but then they would like to to take the in this case a train. Imagine because it's much more efficient and it's faster. No? What happens is that in, in, in every of these uh, stations, you have a, 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 to, to wait for the, for the train or the bus, and then there has to be a space for, the, for them to enter. And these guys are very, very, let's say, very disciplined. So essentially, they wait in line until it's their day turn. Uh, but they do calculations. So essentially, when someone wants to go from one place to another, what it does is to calculate which would be the optimal, the optimal way to do it without any, any sort of congestion. And then if they enter into a station and then they find a, a huge queue, they, they can recalculate the, 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 the movement. And then they see if it is more, let's say, more profitable to stay there and wait for the train or the bus, or they prefer to go walking towards the destination and go to the next station. No? Um, with this kind of, of rules, what we observe is actually there is a clear relation between the, the delay, let's look at delay only, and the, um, the number of individuals in the event. And in the case of one line, uh, this relation is linear. When we are talking about uh, two dimensions, it's one over two. And uh, well, we have also uh, one over D in the case of, of uh, all, all sorts of lattices, no? of higher dimensions. Um, that means that actually there is a kind of relation between the, let's say, the, the congestion and what happens um, in, in the lattice or in the event. And uh, this relation is related to the, the sort of dimensionality. No? So that means that if imagine that we are in the lattice still, and then we take like, for instance, a point here, and then you try to calculate how the, um, the, the capacity of the stations grow uh, as you increase a, a radius out of the place where you are. Uh, this grow is, is um, in the case of, of a lattice, of a two dimensional thing, is quadratic. In the case of three dimensions is uh, to the cube. And so essentially what you get is that the, the growth goes to the D, okay? And then the, the delay grows like uh, the number of people in the event to one over this D, okay? This is important because when we look at cities, we can also generalize this idea. You can just place the, 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 the situation where you have the event and then make a radius and see how the, the capacity increases with the, with the radius from there. And actually this cre creates a kind of uh, dimension, which is um, something that uh, we can measure in, in cities. And actually this is, for instance, Paris, and this is a distribution of the thing. As you see, it's, uh, it's centered around one half, okay? Because the, this is two dimensional at the end of the world at the day, but there is a huge fluctuations towards higher dimensions and towards lower dimensions, okay? So the lower dimension part is easy to explain because this happens because you are close to the end of a line. And the increase of the dimensionality occurs because nearby to the, the place where you have the event, there is a um, big um, concentration of high speed uh, lines, like for instance, metro or, or crossings of, let's say, what is called uh, transportation hubs no? in, in, in these kind of things. Uh, we actually check that actually the, the gamma that we obtain from the delay and the one over D of this local dimension more or less follow a clear correlation in our simulations. And then we can also say in the map, which are the, the, the best places to have the lowest uh, gamma. So that means that you will introduce the, the, the lowest de uh, delays. And also we can measure what happens when you put a fixed number of people. This is when the number of people increases. So this will be the, some places where actually it could be good or bad, depending on which is this gamma. The lowest it is, the, be the, better, the better it will go to have a very, very, very large event, let's say. And if you have a, a finite um, event in number of people, then the things are a little different because in here you are not scaling, you are fixing it, okay? So, well, this is a, a little what uh, we have created, we have done in this in this paper. We have done analytic calculations and then we have done simulations in, in eight world cities. And um, well, we find this kind of, of scaling that, that seems to be kind of robust. Uh, and that was, that was it. Thanks very much, uh, Jose. We move on. We now have uh, Juan. I think we see. Hello. I couldn't unmute. Yeah. OK. Are you there? Okay. We don't... OK. Yeah. Are, are you seeing uh, like many different things or just my presentation? No, we are we are seeing a part of your presentation and your notes and everything. Okay, this should do the thing. Yes. That's okay. okay, so 
Hello, I present this this paper. Probably you remember this was the 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 first in the series of uh, of the pandemic seminar series that we had. Uh, this is a work uh, pre pre pandemic that came out at the beginning of the of this year, uh, made in collaboration with people from Harvard, the, from Sierra Leone, and uh, from uh, the World Health uh, Organization, and we. Uh, so typically, I would I would start by saying that pandemics are pervasive in human history. That you can find some some traces five, even five thousand years ago. That uh, there are many uh, pandemics that have occurred in history. That uh, in, and in in the animal kingdom, you have many many examples of them too. Uh, I would also tell you about the, what is to come. This should be rendering in another way. So this should be showing the, the, the places where uh, this uh, mosquito is able to live and how it's going to change with, uh, with um, global, with climate change. So that we will have these vector-borne diseases that will be more, more um, frequent. At, uh, so Sandra is going to talk about uh, vector-borne diseases, uh, I think, in the next talk. But yes. uh, I think that the, that we need no no more preamble than than what we are uh, facing right now. No, so there, there is uh, <laughs> you are already uh, aware that it's important to to study uh, uh, epidemics and pandemics due to the, the the huge effects that they can have in our normal lives. So what we did? Why did we study uh, cholera and Ebola in, in Sierra Leone? So we wanted to study, uh, so on the one side, we wanted to study what, uh, what is the, the effect of incubation periods in, uh, in the spreading patterns of, uh, of, uh, of a disease. So what you need is basically two diseases that have uh, similar uh, characteristics, like the transmission paths, uh, the, the, the basic reproduction number, uh, their effects on, on their symptoms. So these both uh, diseases cause uh, immobilizing um, diarrhea and vomiting. Uh, they have similar also uh, fatality rates and they are, they are um, affected by, by cultural factors and uh, prone to, to, to have uh, so that uh, water sanitation and hygiene has an effect, a, a positive effect on, on the spreading of them. But uh, these, two, these two diseases have uh, quite different incubation periods. So for, for Ebola, you have a, a long one from eight to 12 days. For cholera, you have one to two days. Then you develop the, the symptoms. There's another reason which is opportunistic, which is that uh, in Sierra Leone, there was a, a, an outbreak of uh, cholera in 2012, 2013, and uh, one of Ebola in 2014, 2015. And the thing is that uh, these two outbreaks uh, occurred against an immunologically naive population and uh, the substrate, so travel patterns, density uh, uh, of population and so on, were basically the same. So you have almost everything is the same except for the incubation period. Uh, regarding characteristics that you want to know for the spreading of a, of a disease, they, have, they, are, they are quite different. In, uh, in what ca kind of uh, bag they are and so on. So our hypothesis is that uh, uh, if uh, the spreading patterns are different, uh, the one of the main reasons should be this difference in incubation period. So what is the incubation period? Just very briefly. So once you get infected, you have some time while, uh, until you develop uh, symptoms, which is uh, the disease. So this, this time is the incubation period. For this work in particular, we made that the incubation period and the latent period are, are totally aligned. So what does this mean? The latent period is the period in which you have been infected, you did not develop symptoms, uh, uh, well, you did or did not, and after the, the latent period, you uh, start being infectious. So this case in this, in this picture here is what happens with uh, COVID-19 right now, that you have a latent period that is shorter than the incubation period, so you can have pre-symptomatic um, transmission of the disease. So what happened uh, with uh, cholera and Ebola? So this is a picture of how, how both outbreaks uh, behave. 
Remember, cholera is the, the one with the short uh, incubation period. Ebola is the one with the long incubation period. You already can see some differences. Cholera starts here around the, the, the capital and uh, it starts spreading a bit uh, later. And it goes in a wave-like pattern while Ebola seems to have a, a more widespread unpredictable pattern. You can see here, bro, I don't know if you can uh, see the images uh, on the top that show some, uh, some uh, contour plots of uh, how it progressed. So what do we learn from uh, these two uh, diseases? What, what characteristic, uh, uh, temporal characteristics do we learn? So we see uh, that shorter incubation periods like with cholera produce uh, more wave-like spreading, uh, spreading patterns, while longer ones display jumps from, from one place to another in the spatial spreading. We also can see, if, uh, if you analyze the data, that uh, shorter incubation periods produce more peaked incidence curves. So it's, it's a shorter epidemic, but with a, a higher peak. While the other one with longer incubation periods, it's, it, uh, it's longer in time and it's like more widespread. We also see that uh, when we look at uh, spatial correlations, shorter incubation periods have higher spatial correlations. So as a physicist, uh, what, what we do is try to do a model that re reproduces this. So you probably have seen many of these uh, versions of uh, this kind of model lately, which is like a variation of the SIR model. So would you start being susceptible? Then if you get uh, in touch with an infected uh, individual with probability lambda, you get to an exposed uh, compartment where you have been exposed, uh, you, you have been infected, but you're not infectious. Uh, after a certain time, uh, tau i, which is um, the, the incubation period itself, you get uh, infect, uh, infectious. And then after the typical time of the disease, you get recovered or you die. Um, so in particular for, for, uh, for these diseases, what we made also is that, uh, so we fixed uh, the time of the disease in five days, uh, and we varied this incubation period. Also what we did is uh, we had a substrate with some, some uh, mobility rules, uh, and the infectious individuals uh, which had developed the, the um, the disease, the symptoms, uh, do not move because you, you get such a strong diarrhea, you basically cannot move. So does this model capture this uh, basic uh, characteristics so of, uh, of these two diseases? So we said shorter incubation periods produce more uh, uh, wave-like patterns while the other ones are more uh, kind of spread. And, and you can see that uh, with the model when you vary this incubation period. We also uh, can produce more peaked uh, epidemics when the incubation period is shorter, when it is longer, the, the epidemic is more widespread in, in time. And also we uh, can produce these uh, higher spatial correlations just by varying this uh, incubation period, having more correlation for shorter incubation periods. So basically, we have shown that uh, there are uh, commonalities and differences in how, how these uh, pathogens uh, spread. And we suggest that the differences are based on the, the difference in the incubation period. We find uh, that the longer incubation periods tend to have less predictable spread, while shorter are more predictable with like uh, pattern. And uh, so this, this has uh, implications to what, uh, what uh, vaccination campaigns you can do. So for short time incubation periods, you could maybe think of a, of a spatial uh, vaccination scheme, while for, for the other ones, uh, you, you should uh, look at uh, contacts and contact tracing, all of this that we have seen during this year uh, a lot. And our simulation model provides a proof of concept that this, uh, these uh, differences in uh, spatiotemporal patterns uh, is rooted in the, in the difference of uh, incubation periods. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. So we continue with Sandro in a related uh, type of paper. Okay. Thank you so much. Can you see the, the slides? No. No. 
No, you so have to. Yeah, I have to share my screen. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now. Oh yes. 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 Okay. Looks better. Great. Great. Thank you so. Thank you so much, Maxi. <laughs> So um, as Juan was saying, actually this has been a very tough year, let's say, and a lot with a lot of COVID-related stress. So with him, we decided just to distract you a little bit, showing you that there are many other diseases that can cause pandemic, not only COVID, that are way worse than COVID. So today I decided to talk to you about uh, vector more diseases that are that actually are sorry that are diseases. Sorry, okay. That are diseases like, for example, uh, dengue, uh, malaria, and Zika. That actually, where the transmission is not, uh, there is no direct trans transmission between humans. But actually, what happens is that you need a vector. And in most of the cases, vectors are um, wild animals. And in most of the cases, this wild animal is actually this small mosquito here, that turns out to be the world deadest animal with more than 1 million deaths uh, each year, mainly from the diseases that it, that it spreads. And as Juan was saying, in the future, the, in the future with the global change, probably the population at risk, so the projection says that the population at risk of dengue, for example, in 2008, it can reach more than 6 billion individuals, billions with, uh, billions with B. So, uh, the question is, how is it possible that this small, uh, this small mosquito that actually during his life you only lives a few days and move just a few hundred meters, how is it possible that it can create, for example, outbreaks at the global level, like happened, for example, with Zika in 2014-16? Um, in uh, well, actually, the answer is that um, we have been looking at things in the wrong way. It turns out that we are the vector of the disease. Actually, it's our movement that is spreading the disease, for example, between different continents. So an essential ingredient, if you want to study this kind of behavior, is to take into account the fact that actually we are the vectors and not the mosquitoes are the vectors. So to do that, the thing that you have to do, for example, is to use um, something similar as uh, Juan using this talk, what, is, what have been called multi-scale models, but actually, what you have, you have at the local level, you have, in this case, is something that includes also the fact the interaction between mosquitoes and human, but also you are modeling the structure of the, our population. So, for example, the vector populations, and most importantly, the fact that we are also modeling human mobility. So, the fact that we move from one place to the other, bring the diseases to other, to other places. If you do that in the, let's say, the proper way, you probably end up with something like this, with this set of equations that are pretty ugly to look at, but they have the advantage that can be solved analytically. So for example, one thing we can do, we can study the spread of disease changes with uh, uh, increase or decrease of the mobility. And actually what we found that is quite interesting is the fact that um, the mobility plays a no trivial role in the spreading. So there is no direct correlation. There is no trivial correlations. And most important, what we found is that even the slightest change in the mobility can totally change, for example, like in this case, the way in which the disease is spreading. So uh, with the slightest change on the mobility, the disease can spread, it can develop in a totally different way. So this is quite important because obviously, if you want, uh, if you design a, stra um, a contention strategy, for example, to stop the disease in one place, probably it will not work in other places because the, the mobility is the mobility is different in that place. So this was, let's say, the first uh, results of this paper. But we decided to go one step further. So we decided to prove to test our model in um, in a realistic scenario. So what we did was uh, to um, we decided to run realistic simulations, for example, in the city of Santiago of the, in, uh, in Colombia, that has two important features. First of all, we have very mm, detailed um, surveys about human mobility. So actually, we were able to reproduce the, the, human, uh, the human mobility network of the city between, for example, the two, 22 districts of the city. As unfortunately, the second important feature is that uh, actually dengue is uh, and there. So actually, we have historical data that we can compare, for example, with our with our model. And this is exactly what we did. 
So um, from the model, we, we derived uh, what we call an epidemic risk indicator. So based on human population mobility. So for each district of the city, what we did, we came up with a prediction. So uh, an epidemic risk for each of the two, 22 districts. And we compared with the and we compared with the real with the real data. And actually, what we found is that actually the, cor the correlation is quite um, it's quite strong. Meaning that even if this is a very model, if you inform it well with the um, real data, actually we can also use it for practical purposes. For example, to make predictions about the spreading of the disease in a real scenario. And with that, I think I'm going to conclude. So let me. Just thank you for your attention. Also, let me thank my, my collaborators in this work, David Soriano, Adriana Reina, and Jesus Gomez Gardenets from the University of Zaragoza, and uh, Eliana Arias and Hector Martinez from the University del Valle in, uh, in, in Santiago de Cali. So thank you so much. Thank you, Sandro. Uh, we then uh, move to Raul, if... Uh... Things are working for him. He had problems. I'll try. Can you hear me at least? Yes. Okay. Then share his screen. Uh, Microsoft. Share. Okay. Perfect. You good? Perfect. Okay. Now this is a uh, no, paper. No, 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 Raul. What we are seeing now is is your screen with your time and your yes, notes. Just a moment. Just a moment. Give me now. Okay. Now give me one ten seconds. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I'll share again. Okay, can you see on the screen? Yes, but we can. Okay, you did something. No, 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 it. no, because I have two two screens. You, okay. you see me, you see the screen. Okay, <laughs> we see the screen. Go ahead. Okay, good. Okay, so we have the, this paper has been published in physical, as the previous one by Sandro in Physical Re Review Research. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is a new journal. You know, this is the second volume of the journal, and this is an open access which uh, happens to or wants to disseminate high quality research from all of physics with intention of receiving the conversation across traditional boundaries, okay, which is quite appropriate for our in the institute goals. Okay, so the paper is rather technical, but that's what it is, okay? So let me try to tell you what the problem is and, and the solution we have to it. So we, we say we, we use binary state model. Um, most of you know what a binary state model. Uh, we have a set of n individuals with nodes which are located on the in the nodes of a network <clears throat> and these individuals can um, have a, a variable which is the binary so it is one or zero we have this infected healthy black white speaking english spanish or whatever interpretation uh, these individuals can change the state with some rates separated per unit time so they can go from the state plus or zero to the minus with or black and white with, with rate R plus and R minus. Okay, this is the, the general setup, which can be used in many, many, many situations. I mean, it has been used in hundreds of setups, okay? Uh, here at the Institute, we have experience in, 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 all, in all of those. <clears throat> in social influence, epidemic spreading, which has show a little bit more complicated models in the previous talks. Language competition, in which you speak a language in B, flocking dynamics, in which the direction of movement left or right is your binary variable. And you can have um, financial markets in which your state <coughs> zero or one is either optimistic or pessimistic. Uh, you have uh, other stakes in, in more traditional physics, chemistry, and other areas. Okay, so this is a quite general problem. <coughs> and our work has consisted in, in developing analytical tools to study those agent-based binary state models in complex networks. And we have included properly or accurately the stochastic dynamical properties. Okay, so our keywords are complex networks and stochastic properties. Uh, let me show you which is the, the, the different ways to proceed when analyzing this problem. And you can use two, two families, okay, of approaches. One is so-called the node state approach. And the second is called the compartmental approach. In the node state approach, 
what you used is to consider all possible variables. You have n variables, each one of them can be zero or one. And then you write, um, you write a, a master equation for this set of variables, and then you try to solve it, okay? Which are the advantage? Of course, the advantage is that with that, you have a complete description. You're taking everything you can into account. You can take the four network structure and should work for network types and all that. Which is the disadvantage? Well, first, of course, here you have a huge number of variables, as many variables as the number of variables you have, as the number of, as the number of individuals you have, okay? And it is difficult, this host, it is difficult to, of course, then you have to make approximations because the, the, the questions you get are so difficult, you cannot solve them. And then you need to make approximations, which in most cases do not give you an accurate close description. Um, more difficult, it is the fact that since those variables are not extensive, or it means that when you double the number of individuals, those variables still remain zero or one. So those variables do not scale with the number of individuals. So when you cannot use the, the typical tools you use in stochastic processes, such as the one campaign systems as expansion. So there are another family of approaches, which was initiated by Gleason uh, seven years ago. It's called the compartmental approach. In the compartmental approach, which comes in many, many, many variations, and let me give you that this approximate master equation called AME, -A -M -E, description, what you do is to consider not the individual variables, but simply group them as the number of nodes in a state, zero, one, which have degree K and two neighbors in state one, okay? So these are the basic variables with which you work. Of course, the number of variables is much less than the number of variables that we have the individual variables, and it has a series of advantages. First, there are less number of variables, and second, those variables are extensive. If you double the number of individuals, those variables double themselves, okay? And this is a key point in our, in our treatment, to be able to work with extensive variables. This advantage is that you lose some of the network structure, and the only thing that appears are the degree distribution, the given moments of the, of the, of the degree distribution of the network. Um, so, so once you have said that this, uh, this compartmental approach, you can do or what people have done mostly is to use deterministic description. In the deterministic description, you look for equations, how, how these variables evolve, and then you take uh, these equations at, a, at a, uh, an average value, and then you replace a function of an, of an average value by the function of the average value. Okay, so you replace the average value of the function by the function of the average, of the average value. So these negative correlations, this sort of, sort of mean field approximation. So our contribution has been to give a full stochastic description of those compartmental approaches, right, which is valid quite generally. This is a problem that already in the paper by, by Gleason that was, uh, that was stated. And we need to consider stochastic descriptions because there are fluctuations due to the finite size of individuals. All these models, uh, you cannot simply take the, 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 the thermodynamic limit because the number of variables is necessarily finite. But you not, do not consider a model with epidemics in which you have infinite number of, of, of people, okay? Uh, even if you take the infinite limit, there are things that you cannot compute with a deterministic approach. That's for instance, the, the, the sustainability. So activity is a measure of the fluctuations, and then you, for that you need to be able to compute the fluctuations of your order parameters. If you make the mean field assumption, this mean value of x squared is equal to the mobile of x squared, and then this disappears. Okay, uh, for the more there are models for which the, uh, the, the mean field description doesn't make anything, you need a stochastic description. For example, the noisy water model. For those of you who know, the noisy water model, the average value is a constant, and the average value doesn't give information at all of what's going on. So what we're going to do is to use this stochastic. So the keyword is stochastic. And since what we're doing is to, is to modify those compartmental approaches after we nearly copy the title from Gleason, which is the same title, but we have included the stochastic one. Of course, uh, uh, Tony Peralta was with James Gleason. He, he stayed with him, so he's fully aware of this, of this change, of this uh, the modification we have used in our paper of, of the title. Now, we're going to give you many details. So when you do a stochastic effect, so you read the books on stochastic, on stochastic effects, and then you need to write the master equation, okay? So this master equation, including the rate of the processes. You do that, and then 
you use some sort of expansion in the number of variables. Okay, this is the basic idea. Simply write the master equation and use an expansion in the number of variables, which makes sense because the the those the variables we're dealing with are extensive. Okay, this that sounds easy took us 25 pages of, of, of physical review research. Okay, so it's a little complicated from the from the technical point of view. And here I just want to show you just the results. Here we have this SIS epidemic model with computer susceptibility, and you can see. And that have the results of the numerical simulations with our approach. It comes in different different formats: the approximate master equation, the pair approximation, the heterogeneous mean field. And we can do this uh, this with our method. Of course, if you do not take a stochastic effect, you get a deterministic solution which is zero. Okay, in the deterministic there are no fluctuations, so there is no susceptibility. Here we can also compute the density of active links. And you can see the different approaches compared with numerical simulations, and of course, ours works better than, than, than others, as a software wisely said. Uh, here's another example in which we do the expansion near a critical point. We use the icing lower model, which is also a binary state model, and we do an expansion near the critical point, and you can see that the scaling functions that we derive from our approach are quite close to the to the to the ones you obtain from the from the, from the numerics. So simply, we have generalized this compartmental mode approaches to talk out stochastic effects. And we use a master equation. And we use a one campaign size system expansion that we can use because the variables you have used are extensive. We check that again, numerical simulations. And, and so, okay. that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Raul. And uh, now we'll uh, finish, if we can, with Claudio. That uh, seems that he has solved his uh, computer problems, and uh, then that will be the last uh, contribution. Please, Claudio, go ahead. How do I stop sharing? Uh, there is a, a dot point, a red point somewhere. Not really. Should be up in your screen. In, uh, OK, OK, sir. Yes, yeah, yes, thank you. <laughs> Now, can you hear me? We can hear you, and we see Raul instead of Claudio, but I don't know. What oh, you... shit. Nothing is working, my no. friend, sorry. Okay. Now, there you are. Go ahead, Claudio. No, because my presentation is not working. Let me try again, please. Does it work now? Do you see it? Yes, we see it. OK, thank you. So the, the presentation of this uh, is uh, an e-life paper, which is uh, is a collaboration with the Instituto de Neurociencias de Alicante, in particular with Santiago Canal, someone that I have had uh, having a large collaboration during the last year, but also people from the uh, Instituto Cajal of Madrid or the University of La Laguna have also participated. So the idea is to study rhythm, rhythm in the hippocampus, but rhythms are uh, epiphenomena that appear very often in the brain, and the, they can appear in different uh, frequencies from the very slow one, which is the delta at 1 to 4 hertz, up to, the, up to the high ones, which cover from the 30 to 100 hertz or even more. In particular, in the theta, in the theta rhythms that, uh, that we are interested on, you can have two... two a typical frequency that four hertz in anesthetized animals or, or in, in humans and eight hertz when we are awake. Uh, so we are interested in the hippocampus. This is a brain structure that plays an important role in episodic memories, but also in spatial navigation. Uh, as I said, there are two rings that are very characteristic. One is the theta ring, which is a slow one, and one is the gamma ring, which is the very, uh, very high one. So if you see the hippocampus here, it's a, a schematic representation. There are three areas that are important, or the most important ones. This is called CA1, CA3, and the dentate gyrus here, and also an interrenal cortex layer, which is the interface between the neocortex, or, or the part of the cortex and the hippocampus. Uh, based on, elect in a, in, on physiological measurement, 
we can distinguish uh, three, these three, we had an electrode more or less in this area, and they are doing independent component analysis on this signal that you see there. We can identify three independent component analysis with which uh, we work, we analyze. So we have several questions here, and uh, I summarized them here. The first one is if, if the theta rhythm is so strong in the hippocampus, how is this one generated? Is there a single uh, theta rim generator or are more of them and are they independent or not? Then if there, this theta rim is and this gamma rim, are they coupled to each other or not? And if they are coupled, are they locked or not? So, in, and if they are locked, are all they lock all the time on, and which one dominates on the other? So I will try to just respond on this question of what we found. Uh, first of all, uh, we know that there is an external theta signal, which is called the medial septum, uh, very well known in neuroscience. But also we found that there were some local uh, generators of theta rings that might be independent, but they can also synchronize for a certain time. They can have a high synchronization, as can be seen on the left side of the figure, or there can be a low synchronization, which means that there are theta rhythm, but these theta rhythm are not all the time synchronized among them. So they they are independently and locally generated within the hippocampus. The second question is how these uh, theta and gamma couple, are they really coupled? Well, this is what is known as cross-frequency coupling. In this case is phase of the slow rhythm, which is the theta with the amplitude of the high rhythm, rhythm which is uh, gamma. And we see that this occurs between the, the phase of theta and the amplitude of gamma and between the different areas we are examining. However, the maximum coupling is found within the same area, between the theta and the gamma rhythm within the same area. Here on the left side, you see, oops, sorry. On the left side, you see the, the different nodes that we have analyzed. In red indicates the maximum power of the theta and gamma coupling. You see, for instance, in this, in this first one, there is a, theta is always eight hertz, and gamma is different, depending on the place. Here is about 50 hertz here is about 80 and here is more than 100. So we see theta gamma coupling, but at different uh, gamma frequencies and a different, in the different places. But uh, we also found that uh, this cross-frequency coupling and the theta synchronization I talked before increase in parallel during novel exploration, which means that if instead of having the animal in, the, in a controlled environment, we put the animal in a new environment, it has to analyze the new environment and what we see is that after a certain short period of, of the order of 100 seconds, the, 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 the correlation or the synchronization of the theta rhythm and the cross-frequency coupling theta gamma increases while the animal is doing the exploration. And then when it knows already after more or less 400 seconds that it knows more or less the place, this, this uh, synchronization and cross-frequency coupling decays to the, to the control situation. With respect to the theta gamma coupling, we find the periods of high synchronization of gamma and theta in which they are locked. So it's clearly seen here in this, in this figure where there's a, 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 a locking between the, the high frequency gamma and the slow frequency theta, but there is also a very low synchronization uh, times. As you see here, the, 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 the synchronization between gamma and theta is very low. So there are clearly indications that sometimes the animal has a high frequency and, and, and has another moment that it has a very low frequency, which means that the animal is doing different things. Finally, when we try to characterize which uh, rhythm fixed the phase, the phase during the locking, we found that uh, contrary to what people believed, that usually people think that the slow rhythm fixed the, the phase of the high rhythm. In this case, we found, or at least we could, we could uh, uh, from our result, we could uh, somehow speculate that the, that the amplitude of the gamma, which is the low power signal, fixes the phase of the theta, which is the high power signal. So in, in summary, what we found are multiple theta frameworks that support a computation either segregated or integrated, depending if the theta rhythm are coupled or uncoupled, or are, sorry, are synchronized or unsynchronized. That means that this computation segregated or integrated depends on the synchronization level. Uh, we have uh, we find a high level of synchronization rim during exploration, which means that while the animal is paying attention, this uh, synchronization increases. And then the interaction between the phase of the theta oscillation and the amplitude of the gamma activity is found with the amplitude of the gamma fixing the phase of the theta. So that's all, and thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Claudio. Uh, 
thanks uh, everyone for your uh, uh, contribution to this uh, seminar. Uh, we thank the speaker and we thank also all the people that have uh, uh, attended the, uh, um, this uh, special seminar. I just uh, want to finish in, uh, uh, having the, the best wishes for you for the uh, next year, 2021. We hope that it is better than this one. That would not be uh, too difficult. And uh, I hope to see uh, you around yet for, uh, for a few days. And then next year, we will try to continue with our online seminars and doing our activity as best as we can in the, uh, in the uh, present situation. So thanks again, uh, everyone. Uh, keep safe and uh, enjoy your work. Where is the food? No food. No, no, no. food. No.